So I'm part of the novella node, which is led by Anne Phoenix, and is all about narratives of everyday life. And that node is going to be using some data from the Millennium Cohort Study that I'll talk about very briefly. But I'm also director of the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, which is funded by ESRC and has close links with National Centre for Research Methods. So it's more with my CLS hat that I'm giving this presentation. I'm not just saying do put your hand up and interject and ask questions, but I will actually stop at various points in the presentation and encourage questions. This is a rather different presentation from the two we had before coffee because it's not about a particular set of analytic techniques, it's more about particular sorts of data sets and what you can do with them. But it does follow on very well because you could use event history analysis and multi-level modelling with cohort study data. So this is the sort of overview of what I want to cover. To start with the British Birth Cohort Studies at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. And it's worth saying at this point that Britain is unique in the world in having such a fabulous portfolio of national birth cohort studies. I'll talk through in the presentation the difference between a cohort study and a panel study. And although other countries have some fantastic longitudinal resources, nowhere has the same set of birth cohort studies that Britain has. So our data is used by researchers internationally. What I want to do is to give some examples of some different cohort studies. I'll talk through the 1958 cohort study in most detail because then that gives you sort of one exemplar and then I'll show you what some of the differences are between that 58 study and some of the others. As I said, I'm going to talk about the distinction between a cohort study and a panel study, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of both, and I'm hoping to have uh, time to give at least one example of some research that really exemplifies the best use of cohort data. And I've got a couple of slides at the end about how to find out more and how to access the data, and although I need to leave promptly just after 12, there's a CLS stall in that sort of main coffee area, and so colleagues of mine will be there until the end of the, the festivals, and there's leaflets and things, so do follow up and look at our website if you want more information. So, in terms of the national birth cohort studies, there are four existing studies, and the ones outlined in red here are the ones that we look after at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Now, there are now firm plans for a 2012-2013 cohort study that is being led by Carol Deserter at the Institute of Child Health. So some of you may know that she's running something in mid-July to really give us an overview of the design of that new study. And this is a rather different study. I'm happy to answer questions about that um, later on, so I can talk a little bit about that. But these are the three that we're responsible for at CLS that are all funded by ESRC. And I think it's quite funny, really, that the 1958 study is still known as the National Child Development Study, given that these people are in their mid-50s. So they're very much in late youth now. <laughs> yes. So why do we call these cohort studies? And I suppose, you know, when I first heard about cohort studies, I just thought about primary school and Roman cohorts. So why, you know, is it the same word? And I suppose my understanding of it is it's because we're thinking about individuals who are moving forward together from a specific point in time. So I'll be mainly talking about birth cohort studies, but clearly you could have a cohort study that started with everybody who was married in a particular year or you could look at cohorts of students who wouldn't necessarily be the same age group, but you'd be following the same cohort through time. So it's about following a group of people that have a common starting point in the same way that a Roman cohort moved forward through time. It would be great, really, if our cohort members just sort of lined up so neatly for us to interview them, but unfortunately they're a bit more of a sort of ragged crew than a Roman cohort. So, I'll talk in most detail about the 58 cohort study because it provides a sort of exemplar for the methodology and uh, people give you a bit more insight into the way that cohort studies work. So, the 58 study started as a perinatal mortality study. It was never intended as a longitudinal study when it was set up. It's based on every child that was born in one week in March in 1958. 
Now, uh, back in 1958, there weren't the same sort of ethics consent guidelines. So you can imagine, literally, the midwife would have sat down on the bed and said, well, Mrs. Elliot, you're in a study. And, you know, we want to find out information about your baby, your labour, um, the birth, and, you know, your, a little bit about your social circumstances. And the real concern there was to improve the perinatal mortality rates because there was concern that 10 years after the start of the National Health Service, there were still relatively high rates of young infant death. And then the story goes that in the early to mid-60s, the Plowden Committee was doing a review of primary education and realised that they had very little empirical evidence of how primary education was serving different groups of children. And so they realised that this study that would be a good baseline and that they could follow up children by going to schools and saying, have you got any children born in this one week? And that that would be a way of recontacting the children. And then they would have date, basic data on birth circumstances and they would also have the data on them in, in school. And that's how it became a longitudinal study and why, to begin, begin with, it was called the National Child Development Study. And then in the late teens, there was a um, feasibility study carried out to see if it was going to be possible to follow these individuals up through adult life. And you can see the ages there, the sample followed at 7, 11, 16, etc. And you can see it doesn't look very planned, particularly. There's a big gap between 23 and 33, and another big gap between 33 and 42. Well, this was very contingent on funding and the fact that there was very little funding for this sort of social research during the 80s and 90s. And now there is much more commitment from ESRC and indeed MRC to these longitudinal studies. And so there's much more of a plan to go back every four or five years so that you're not asking people retrospectively to, to think over too long a period. So it started off with 17,000. There are about 10,000 individuals still participating. And it's really mainly very quantitative, highly structured data that's collected. But I can say a little bit about some of the qualitative data that's been collected recently as well. So this is another way of representing the cohort. And compared with a panel study, when, well, particularly compared with a household panel study, what distinguishes the British birth cohort studies is that the focus is really on the subject. Now, clearly, so on one person rather than on a household. Now, clearly, in young childhood, you can't ask a child that much about their circumstances, and so there tend to be other ways in which data is collected about them. But as they move into adult life, the main focus of data collection is on that one cohort member. And you can see how the sample size changes from about 17, nearly 18,000 at birth, down to there being a sample we tried to contact of, of 12 um, and a bit thousand at age 50. And then at the bottom here is the achieved sample size. So as I said, we're in touch with about 10,000 cohort members. And to put that in context, out of those originals of 17 and a half thousand, about 1,500 have died by the time they're 50, and about 1,500 have emigrated. And we don't try and stay in touch with people once they've, they've left the country. So, so it's about, you know, you're talking about sort of 65, 66% response rate, even so many years later. And one of the big advantages of these sorts of longitudinal studies is, of course, you know a lot about the people who aren't still responding. So whereas if you went out and did a new study and did a cross-sectional study, you, you'd be quite pleased to get a 60% response rate, but you also would know nothing about the 40% who hadn't responded. Here you do have very good data on them from childhood. And the other thing to point out here is the real advantage and the sort of unique selling point of these birth cohort studies is that you've got prospectively collected data in childhood and very good triangulated data. So as well as the mother being asked to rate her child's behaviour and difficulties, you've also got teachers' ratings of the child. And people have found in sort of modelling of outcomes in later life that actually it's the teachers that ratings that are better predictors of later outcomes. And that's fairly intuitive because the teachers have got a sort of broader comparison group than the, the mother themselves. 
but also there were medical examinations done on the children during childhood, so you've got good data on you know, growth, height, weight, those sorts of issues, but also on sight and hearing, so it's really a multidisciplinary resource, and that's true of the 1970 cohort and the Millennium cohort as well. And also, through childhood, the children did some um, tests in school, so you've got sort of measures of their cognitive ability, reading tests and maths tests at different ages. So, one, another way of visualising this is to think about a particular individual. So, for this cohort, they were all born in one week of 1958, and you've got the sort of contextual information about things like parents' social class at birth, whether the mother was smoking, and then you've got a number of variables that might be repeated through childhood, like how interested the parents were in the child's schoolwork. So, the teachers reported on how interested parents were. Things like free school meals, I've mentioned math and reading tests but then you've also got sort of key dates like you know if parents have divorced you know roughly when the divorce took place and the line sort of goes on you can see the different ages at which the children were surveyed and then became adults we've got exam results that is almost like an administrative data source so those have been collected directly from schools rather than the children or young people having to remember their exam results and then you've got events like getting married and having children. So these would be the sorts of data, those of you who are in the event history analysis session, it's exactly this sort of data that would be really amenable to that sort of event history analysis approach. And equally, we've got retrospective work histories. So this could be a sort of stereotypically female um, career plan where you've done a couple of jobs, um, got married just after age 23, had a couple of children and not been in the labour market, and then gone back into the labour market and the dotted line there showing going back into part-time work. And there's been a lot of research using this cohort and other cohorts to see the length of time between having a first child and going back into the labour market and how that's changed for different cohorts. So people like Heather Joshi have done a lot of work on that. A few more variables to give you a sense of the sorts of multidisciplinary, multi-topics that we cover. But this is really just a smattering. We've got about 17,000 variables on every individual. So about 17,000 pieces of information on everybody in the cohort study. So one thing that I get a bit frustrated by is sometimes only a few, but some people who do qualitative research say qualitative research is much more detailed. Now, this is an incredibly detailed account of somebody's life. It's clearly not a qualitative account because you haven't asked the cohort member for their perspectives, you haven't got it from their point of view. But in terms of the richness of the data, this is really excellent uh, data source, excellent resource. Okay, so the most recent survey was at age 50 with the 1958 cohort, and I've just listed there, I won't read through them all, but you can see the sort of range of different topics that were covered, and it's probably worth just highlighting a couple here. So, although we hadn't asked lots of cognitive things throughout adulthood, we asked for the first time about memory and concentration, so people did a little memory test, 10 words that they memorised. Um, and concentration tasks. And we also, for the first time at 50, asked the cohort members to consent to record linkage. So this is both to hospital and health records, but also to administrative records. And one of the exciting things in the future is how this data can be augmented by matching it into administrative data. So, this Kelvin was having problems with this as well. So I was going to move on and talk about the 1970 cohort, but I'll just pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions on the, the 58 study. I was just going to note, uh, we are showing the 7-Up series here at the festival. They're a little bit older than the 58 cohort, but that's kind of an, quite an interesting sort of parallel take on following through, isn't it? Do you yes. Yeah, well, a silly comment is that whenever I try and explain to anyone what my job is, they say, oh, the 7-Up series. And I then have to say, well, sort of, but they've got about 25 people and we've got 10,000. <laughs> Um, and there are all sorts of apocryphal stories about whether Michael Apted got the idea of 7-Up 
from the cohort study, but it doesn't quite add up, as apocryphal stories often don't, because they are slightly older, um, but they, so they would have been, I'm not sure many people would have known about the 58 study in 1965 when the data was being collected, but it would be, I'd love to be able to ask Michael Apted at some point. But it also, I think, shows that both studies, you know, the Plowden Committee looking at primary education and the sort of social class impact and whether children were being served by the, the primary education, it's very similar in a way to Michael Apted's sort of interest. I mean, he was a researcher at the beginning of it, trying to find children from different social classes. So there are some real parallels there. But of course, with the 7-Up, you get the visual and you get the individual person's recollection and sort of their perspectives on it, but you don't have quite as, you don't have as much data on them, so and, and not as many of them. Yes. Can you say something about the geography of the sample? Um, is there anything particular about it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Well, I'll, I'll briefly say something about it. So it's basically a great British study. So it's Scotland, Wales, and and England, and there was no oversampling in Wales and Scotland. So we have, we've now got about 1,000 people in Scotland and about 500 in Wales. So it's not great for doing comparisons between countries because you haven't got really big samples in those countries. Um, when people want to do geographic analysis, we deposit in the archive at the level of region. So you can easily do some regional things. We obviously have postcodes for the more recent data. So it is possible to match in some more geographically detailed data, and a few people have, have done that. But we don't make that very readily available because of the problem of wanting to keep people's anonymity preserved. And roughly, there's one cohort member per 5,000 people in the population. So those of you who know what a ward is, um, you know, that rough, I mean, obviously wards are different sizes, but you've roughly got one person per ward. So it's not great. I mean, now we've got the localism agenda from the government, it's not great for saying what's happening in Birmingham to, to cohort members. But if you take the approach of using things like ACORN characteristics and saying, you know, are there sort of coastal influences or people living in areas where there's declining manufacturing and a growth, in a, then you could do some really quite interesting geographical things. And it's an area that hasn't been fully exploited. We would love more geographers to use the data. And we've got some additional funding for something called the Cohort Resources Facility, which will help that a bit more. So that's a bit of a long answer, but it's a good question. Yeah, very quick one. On data linkage, you talked about potential for linking this data, longitudinal data, with administrative data, I guess. Yeah. About. Given the absence of unique identifiers in this data, how would you do that? So you can use people's NHS numbers and their national insurance numbers. So they do, they are, and they are uniquely identified by their dates of birth. Just do with health data, and not social data, and social care data and stuff. Like that. Well, the most obvious one is the hospital episode statistics, but there's also things like the DWP longitudinal study, which has got periods of, of time in benefit and things. Now, there's a lot of practical work to be done to see how well the match would work, but um, it, is, it does look like a possibility because we've got very high consent rates. So you'd still have a slight attenuation of the sample because not everyone's consented and then not everybody would be matched. Because of consent as well, isn't it? That's the kind of thing. Yes, yeah, that's right. And we were, we were careful to do lots of discussion with the government departments before we got consent so that we gave people really a lot of information about it. We got slightly higher rates of consent to the health data than to the, the, the administrative data. Okay, so to move on very briefly about the 1970 study, a very similar structure, so I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. Again, the same geographical issues, so it's in Great Britain rather than across the whole of the UK. And again, you can see this slightly random um, ages at which cohort members were contacted, again, for sort of practical resource reasons. And we're saying that at age 26, it was just a postal survey because there was no funding for more than that. But even a postal survey, they managed to get 9,003 people to respond. And one of the great things about these cohort studies is that because people have been in them since birth, they have a real sort of commitment, more so than if you go out and get a new cross-sectional study. So as we speak, the ninth sweep of BCS 70 is taking place, and there's a 
a 75-minute face-to-face interview. And again, for the first time at age 42, they're being asked for consent to, to link to their, their records. So a rather different study that we look after, at, well, slightly different at Centre for Longitudinal Studies, is the, uh, is the Millennium Cohort Study. Now, this, the, one of the main differences about this is the, the geography of it. So roughly the same <coughs> size, you know, nearly 20,000 children. So one difference is that it doesn't look at everybody born in one week, but rather it's births spread over a whole year. And part of the reason for that is a sort of scientific reason of wanting to be able to use the data to look for uh, effects of when you're born in the year and whether that has an impact on your development and your schoolwork. But also just a practical thing that we're not using midwives anymore. It's a professional survey agency that went out and did the interviews and they just wouldn't have the capacity to do everybody in, in one week. And it covers Northern Ireland as well as Scotland, Wales and England. And there are boosts in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So it is much more possible to make comparisons between the four countries. And also there have been oversamples for those areas with high child poverty and looking at just England for areas with high ethnic minority populations. So one of the problems with the older two cohorts is that because it focused on everybody born in Britain in one week, you've got relatively few immigrants, so it's a very sort of white population. Whereas for the Millennium Cohort Study, there's actually an oversampling of minority ethnic groups. And to give a sense of the, the difference then with the Millennium Cohort Study, this is just a very brief overview of the sorts of things that have been asked about. You can immediately see that this has been much better planned and resourced than the earlier cohort studies. So rather than just seeing people you know, at a couple of ages, it's at nine months, three years, five years, seven years, and we're currently in the field with the age 11 survey. And whereas the older cohorts only asked the mothers about the child, with this cohort they've also asked about the father, and in fact the father could be the main respondent, although they rarely are. Um, and l again, lots on cognitive assessment, physical measurements and questions being asked to the teacher. So in some ways, very similar sort of um, basic method of, of data collection. OK, so one of the things that I like to draw attention to is the narrative elements of cohort studies. People often think of narratives as just being about words and how can cohort studies be narratives because it's structured quantitative data. But in a way, we, we're creating a narrative about the individual's lives because we're following the same individual through time. And there is a sort of narrative structure to our analyses. If we're asking the question, how do early life circumstances have an impact on later outcomes? And you could actually use the data in an innovative, imaginative way to construct case studies rather than just doing statistical modelling. As long as you preserve the anonymity, you could actually use the data to construct a, a sort of life story or case study for an individual. The other thing, if they're used properly, cohort studies, should, we should really be taking account of the historical context that helps shape the individual's experiences as they go through life. And we can also make comparisons between the cohorts so that we can construct a narrative about social change. So you've got sort of individual life stories or narratives, and then you might think about a meta-narrative using a number of different cohorts to see how things are changing. So this is just a diagram of some of the co ways you could use cohorts. So very simply, comparing the 58 and the 70 cohort, you can say, you know, how is a 16-year-old's life different in 1974 from 1986? And then in a few years, we'll be able to say, and how different is it for the Millennium Cohort Study Child? And historians are beginning to get interested in this because even the questions that are asked and the way that the questions are framed tells you something about the historical time. So, for example, in childhood, in the 58 study, mothers were asked, what part does the father play in managing the child? <laughs> now, you just can't imagine asking that these days. We certainly, the Millennium Cohort Study doesn't ask that. 
So you can partly use the cohorts to make comparisons between cohorts, but you can also look at life cycle effects to see things like how people's smoking behaviour, how their physical activity changes over time. Uh, there's not much on diet, but Chris Power's done some work on how diet has changed over time uh, through the life course. So this just emphasises the importance of understanding the historical context. And although these cohorts, the 58 and the 70, are born just 12 years apart, this is quite neatly just from a, a textbook by Cathy Marsh, but it spans 74 to 86, which is when the 58 cohort was 16 and thinking about leaving education, and 86 when the 1970 cohort were leaving school. And the solid line there is the unemployed claimant count. And you can see how for these two cohorts, just 12 years apart, how different their view would have been of the welcoming or not so welcoming labour market. And again, you know, that, that plays into today's environment where we're thinking about how the, the financial crisis and problems in the labour market might be, might be affecting new cohorts going through. And an example of a sort of cre creating a meta-narrative using cohorts, this is some work that was done a few years ago by uh, Jenny Neuberger, and she was looking at women's employment over time using the 46 cohort as well as the 58 and the 70. And you can see this is the 46 cohort and this is the proportion of women in paid employment. And you can see how in the early 20s to sort of age 30 it really dips down so that you've got fewer than half of the cohort, of the female cohort in employment. But then, just 12 years later, the 1958 cohort showing a similar pattern, but at a very different level, where women are leaving the labour market to have a first child, but spending much less time out of the labour market. And then a totally different pattern for the 1970 cohort, where women are tending to um, delay childbirth and also spend much shorter time out of, out of the labour market. So in a way there, you've got two different narratives overlaid on each other because you've got the individual women's narratives about spending time out of the labour market, but then you've also got a societal narrative about how women's employment is, is changing. Okay, so I was going to move on and talk about the difference between cohorts and panels. I'll pause again and see if there are any questions at this point. It just makes it more interactive if people have got... No? Okay. So, cohort studies and panel studies, both really useful um, techniques, longitudinal techniques. But I've just listed some of the sort of key differences. Now, in a way, some of these aren't exactly definitional differences. It's more to do with a sort of custom and practice in Britain of how these things have been carried out. But one of the key things about the, the birth cohort studies is that all the individuals in the sample are the same age. So that's not so good if you want to say something about attitudes in Britain, because all you can say is 58-year-olds, or people born in 1958 or people born in 1970 think this. But the big advantage of that is that you've got an enormous sample who all share, the, the sharing the same transitions. So that leads on to point two, which is that the data collected can really focus on their specific life stage. So we're just about to ask the 1958 study questions at age 55, and we're going to be asking them about how much time they're spending looking after elderly parents, and how much time they're spending looking after grandchildren, and also about their plans for retirement. Now, those questions wouldn't sit so easily in a study that was trying to cover the whole age range. And if you've got... In Britain, the sort of key panel study used to be the British Household Panel Study and is now Understanding Society. And of course, the focus there is on households and household dynamics, whereas with the cohort studies, it's very much more on individual trajectories. Again, the difference between Understanding Society and the cohorts is that for the cohort studies, the data collection is much less frequent. So we're going back to people every four or five years, whereas for um, understanding society, they're going back every year. And there's tended to be a lot more sort of multidisciplinary work done with the birth cohort studies, so more objective health measures and health measures in, in childhood. And although there's been some funding of that um, in BHPS and understanding society, it's much more of a sort of economic study. 
So, I mean, the, the key sort of definitional difference is that a cohort study is everybody uh, of a similar age or moving forward through time, whereas a panel study is just a repeated study of a group of individuals who might not share that, that starting point. But then there are some sort of custom and practice differences in terms of the British context and the, the different studies there. Yeah. <coughs> How do you assess the, the attempt to create a, uh, a quasi cohort using census data going backward? How would you assess it, or what would the the possibility of doing that? So how, what would be the issues you find around that? Okay, so some people have tried to look at cohorts within something like the longitudinal, the ONS longitudinal study, which does match. So there, there is a data set that maps all the co all the censuses from 1971. And someone in this room might well be in it. You don't know whether you're in it or not. It's all completely anonymised. The problem with the stat is although you've got a huge sample, you haven't got very much detail. The questions are very narrow, yeah. Because the, you, there's very, yeah, as you say, the questions are quite, quite narrow on the census. But for some research questions, then that would be the ideal source. So I think it's always important with these sorts of talks and presentations, it's not saying a cohort study is the only resource that you should use. It's saying you should look at your research question and decide you know, which is the appropriate source of data. So if you're interested in household dynamics and if you want to know how a, a man and a woman in a partnership report on domestic division of labour from the same household, then you should be using something like BHPS or Now Understanding Society. But if you're interested in how children sort of early life impacts on their later life, then you would want the, one of the, the cohort studies. I'm aware that time marches on. I'm not going to talk very much about qualitative resources. I'll just give the example of the children's essays. So although these are mainly quantitative um, data sets, there are some examples of qualitative material. And at age 11, the children were asked, imagine you're 25 years old, write about the life you're leading, your interests, your home life and your work at the age of 25. You have 30 minutes to complete this. And this is a, an example of, of a microfiche of one of those essays. So when I talked to the people who were running the study at the time, they said, well, back in 1969, we just thought this was a good idea, but we didn't have a particular research question in mind. We just thought it would be interesting. But there are all sorts of resources like this that are attached to the cohort studies that, again, haven't really been analysed. And there could be, there's all sorts of ways in which you could use this material. So in terms of the form of it, you know, handwriting, grammar, spelling, or you might be interested in the content and how people have thought about their future lives um, and we've done some qualitative interviews at age 50 so we've also now got a qualitative repository of 220 interviews on the 58 cohort but I'm not going to have time to go through that so I'm just going to give an example of a really excellent piece of uh, research by a colleague of mine, Anna Vignoles, and this is excellent because it really exemplifies the advantages of cohort data so what they wanted to do was to look at both the 58 and the 70 cohort to find out what the labour market value was of literacy and numeracy. So saying over and above people's qualifications, do having good basic skills improve your income? And what they were able to do was to use the test score information collected during childhood, so these objective measures of children's sort of cognitive skills during childhood, as well as information on qualifications and employment in, in order to enable them to look at the impact of basic skills on wages. So they were using the longitudinal nature of the data to see how basic skills have an impact, controlling for some sort of underlying ability. But they also wanted to do cross-cohort analysis to see whether the changing labour market might mean that having basic skills got more or less important um, through time. And they, they don't sort of say we've got a real causal effect here, you have to be very careful about imputing cause, but the richness of the data that's available means that you can really control for a lot of different observable characteristics. So I'll skip through this because that's just some examples of the sorts of questions that were asked. But one thing then is just to use the data to see how numeracy has changed over time. 
and it's the, the darker blue ones at the bottom that are the people that are struggling at entry level two or below, and level two is the age 16 or above, so the sort of pink ones are sort of GCSE level of numeracy. And you can see that on the, the left is the 58 cohort, and you can see a much bigger group there, much bigger proportion with problems with numeracy. So numeracy actually seems to have improved over time using these cohorts. So that was just some descriptive background. And literacy, you can see literacy less of a problem than numeracy because these proportions down here are much smaller. The blue is much smaller here with people with really struggling with these basic skills. But again, an improvement over time with the 1970 cohort having better basic skills. So all the rhetoric about dumbing down and, you know, people can't spell in the way they used to. Sometimes it's good to actually have some evidence, I think, and uh, look at that. But as I say, that was some descriptive background work. But the work that they did in the sort of more sophisticated modelling showed that literacy and numeracy did have an impact on earnings, even for individuals with the similar levels of education. And they didn't find big gender differences. And in terms of the sort of quantifiable effect, it was one standard deviation difference had about a 15% increase in earnings. But the sort of final point of this is that the cross-cohort comparisons show that actually over time the value of basic skills has remained stable. So that although, as you saw from those descriptive bar charts, there are now more people around with those basic skills, you might think that that then meant that they were less valued by the market because there are more people who could do things. But actually the increase in that supply of skills has been matched by an increase in demand for skilled workers between these, these two cohorts. So I think that's quite a neat example, both of how you would use the cohort data to look at a single cohort and how basic skills might impact on later earnings, but also how it, you can look at change or stasis over time. Right, I'm going to just skip to how do I access the data, and I'm not going to read all this out, but just to point out that the data is all anonymised, documented and archived with the Economic and Social Data Service. We're very keen for lots of people to use the data. The cohort members themselves want to be part of a study that makes a difference. We already have hundreds of people downloading the data every year, but there's still vast untapped areas that, that people could be doing more research on and geography is, I think geographers are a group that haven't used the data very much. So I very much encourage you to, to go to the data archive and go to our website to, to find out more about the studies. <coughs>